is actually on trauma and stress related disorders. Um, after I agreed to do this, then I started getting stressed myself. So uh, it's actually a huge topic. Uh, I have to narrow it down so that it suits um, the timing and suits the audience as well, all right? So um, apologies if some of it is a little bit too complicated. I'll try to provide enough room so that people can ask questions if needed, okay? So, um, and I'm mostly going to be covering just the common disorders and uh, not so much of the less common ones. Okay, so uh, first we want to talk, I, I would like to talk a bit about stress. Uh, so this one is uh, taken from the mindfulness uh, book, uh, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, but uh, stress is not just about a mindfulness thing, right? Um, so obviously anyone in life or at some point in life uh, would have experienced stress. It's just one of the facts of life, right? Um, what's the definition of stress? So that's uh, the question. So in the broadest definition, and bear in mind, there are many different definitions. Um, later, I will show you some and what's the implication of that uh, in terms of uh, the practice of psychiatry. So uh, in a very general uh, definition, stress is simply just uh, um, a kind of pressure to the organism. Yeah, the, can be human, can be animals, uh, any living being, basically. Um, when there is an increase in demand or increase in pressure, uh, circumstances that is actually beyond the capacity of uh, the organism to cope with. Okay, so now, now consider that in, in its broadest term. So whether you are a human or not, uh, then uh, that's what stress means. Even plants can get stressed uh, when we talk about uh, stress in that sense. So it's beyond the capacity of the organism to cope with. And as a result, they suffer in some extent, all right? So now specific to humans, uh, this is what we can see. So um, th this is a very common slide that's used in uh, some mindfulness training. So you might have seen it before, but it's a good slide. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, from Dr. John Kabat-Zinn's book. Um, when we talk about stress, uh, the other thing that sometimes um, people might forget is that there is an internal component of that, right? So there is uh, the external stuff that happens and then there is the internal stuff that happens. Now, the internal stuff can be anything from your own thoughts, your own memories, feelings, and all that, and that will differ from person to person, obviously. Uh, or it could also be, um, in a sense, uh, biological events, yeah? So like a faster heartbeat and all that. So uh, we can see that um, when a stress event happens uh, in the human body, uh, and in some higher order animals, so, so like mammals, for example, uh, you will see some stress reaction happening. So in this case, um, we see that uh, there is a, what we call the HPE axis, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that later. So those are basically uh, the organs um, that pass down this information about stress um, to alert the, the whole body to know that uh, there is something is going on. Yeah. Um, and physically, what the person feels, again, different from person to person, um, it, but generally will involve some changes in the heart rate, some changes in the blood pressure, some changes in uh, skin conductivity. That means uh, the person sweats more, right? Um, and a lot of internal changes that the person may not be aware of. So this includes an uh, increase in blood sugar level. Yeah. So essentially the body goes into what is sometimes called as the fight or flight response. Um, it's quite a common term. So a lot of people probably would have heard it before and probably would have heard of the word adrenaline as well. Yeah, so adrenaline is the hormone uh, that is produced by the adrenal glands. Uh, those are the structures that are sitting on top of your kidneys uh, that when activated through, through this uh, HPA axis will start producing this hormone called adrenaline, right? So the reactions of uh, the body to this hormone includes uh, the faster heartbeat, uh, higher blood pressure, uh, increased glucose level. Yeah? Uh, essentially, the body goes into a sense that uh, it needs to defend itself physically. Um, so either by running away or by fighting. Both requires a great deal of energy. Yeah? So there is a surge of energy essentially in the body. Uh, to help survival. So uh, bear in mind that uh, once upon a time, 
or in a, a in a time far far away in human history as long as there's been humans um at some points uh, this kind of mechanism is extremely helpful it's uh, it contributes to survival it is probably what contributes to the fact that there are modern humans surviving in the world today right um humans basically got no teeth no sharp teeth no claws it's not humans are not particularly fast we don't have like a uh, thick skin like the rhinoceros or the pangolins how do we survive right so um this is one of the mechanisms that allow um, humans in the old days to survive until today, right? So, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, the kind of stress that we face today is no longer the kind of stress we can run away from, right? So, uh, if in the past your survival matters, um, or a human survival matters from the fact whether you can run away or fight uh, an animal, for example, uh, we don't do that anymore these days. Well, unless um, while animals are escaping from the zoo, right? Which I hope is not happening yet. So um, what's happening is that we get a lot of emails. Sometimes we get scolded by our boss, maybe, right? Uh, sometimes we get a huge project that uh, causes us to not sleep so much because we have to finish it. Okay, so th those are the kind of stresses uh, that modern humans face these days. Um, those who are active on social media, um, even those up arrows and down arrows, um, or thumbs up or thumbs down, or angry face, uh, angry smiley, could produce some stress as well, right? So uh, do consider that as well, uh, the impact of uh, your daily activities, um, that how it might affect your stress level. Now, all these things doesn't mean that um, we want to avoid stress at all costs. Um, number one, it's not possible, right? Number two, a small amount of stress is actually good for you, kind of. All right, so I'll move on to the next slides and uh, we see how that works. Okay, earlier I mentioned the HPA axis, that's the hypothalamus um, here. That's uh, one of the small structures in the brain, in the middle of the brain, um, which then release a hormone called CRH, uh, corticotropin releasing hormone, to another small structure directly underneath it. Yeah, uh, which is called the anterior pituitary, which then release uh, another hormone uh, called SCTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Now, this hormone goes all over the body, and um, once it reaches the adrenal glands, uh, which I mentioned earlier, then the gland get the message, okay, start shooting out adrenaline, all right? So that's uh, what, uh, well, sorry, in this, in this case, uh, there are actually two hormones I'm talking about, right? Uh, sorry, go back to the previous slides. Um, so adrenaline is one hormone uh, that, that is responsible for the immediate stress response, the faster heart rate and all that. Okay, whereas uh, the cortico corticoid hormones, uh, glucocorticoid hormones, which is produced by a different part of the adre adrenal gland. So both are produced by the adrenal glands, but in different parts. So this one is more responsible for the long-term effect of stress. Right, so there are actually some impact impact uh, of this uh, hormone on uh, on uh, the immune system, okay, um, and on memory and on uh, glucose uh, metabolism, right. Um, it is actually also used um, or uh, the manufactured form of it is actually used as a medicine as well to suppress the immune system on purpose for certain types of conditions. So, um, and then we go into what may be considered stressful from a, from a situation. So there is a study that involves these uh, glucocorticoid hormones. So they actually measure, uh, measure the stress uh, hormone levels in the body. Um, and they found that the kind of situations that the body considers stressful includes things that are novel. So something that's new to you, uh, things that are unpredictable, or that you cannot control. And lastly, of course, things that are threatening. Yeah. So, which is why, uh, and sometimes we will get, get uh, people wonder about this. Yeah. So sometimes there are questions about this. Uh, why um, does a supposedly um, joyful event or an auspicious event, uh, you get promoted, for example, or you get married, for example, how can these events that normally people would consider as pleasant, um, as joyful, uh, be considered stressful okay, because that's just how the body works 
Yeah, so these events are actually uh, quite novel, quite new to the person. Um, and in a sense, it is a learning process as well. So there, there is some impact on uh, how this uh, hormone actually works on the memory system. All right. So um, let's think about um, a time in your life when you do something exciting. Maybe you do bungee jumping or you travel to some far flung country or you take airplane for the first time. All right. So if you can remember these events, uh, you may find that there is a certain quality to these memories. It seems like uh, more memorable, it seems stronger, more detailed recollection is possible. Yeah. Why? Because it's, it's new, it's something exciting. Yeah. And uh, in, in, a, in, a, in fact, in the case of uh, those bungee jumping or other extreme sports, uh, the memory can be very strong there yeah, because of the fear response again. So uh, that's an example of how um, these stress hormones can affect memory as well. Okay, earlier I mentioned that uh, some amount of stress is actually good for the person. Okay, um, how that works is that um, there is an old, old psychological study um, that actually finds that, uh, and we can say that this low and high arousal is a kind of stress. Yeah, so uh, when in psychological terms, when we say arouse, uh, that could also mean that you're psycho uh, psychologically or physiologically aroused, yeah? like, like you're awake, alert. Okay, so that's uh, what it means here. And um, basically, at a certain level in the middle here, you have better performance, right? Now, bear in mind, this is a simplified uh, diagram. Okay, uh, in the original one, apparently there is another graph here that goes up and up and up. Yeah, so, so this is uh, what happens in a task that is uh, somewhat complex, right? Like, like most of the things we do on a daily basis. Even typing an email can be quite complex, right? Um, but if a task is repetitive and um, for example, you just simply have to press a button, yeah, just, just keep pressing a button, um, then increased stress or increased arousal um, often does not result in impaired performance. Yeah, you just just uh, you just can press the button faster. That's all. Yeah, with, with more energy and uh, uh, more motivation to do it. Uh, hopefully. Okay, but for for most tasks uh, that we engage in, uh, tasks that require planning, require some form of uh, verbalization, perhaps require some thinking about the past, present, future. Uh, tasks that require some a certain broadness of attention um, that you wouldn't want to be uh, having a tunnel vision. Uh, in a way, yeah. So those kind of tasks tend to deteriorate as the stress stress level goes up. Okay. So this is uh, so there is an optimal level. Uh, most people probably or most anybody who has gone for exams probably can um, relate to this to some extent. So we know that um, when we don't think the exam is important, um, let's say the teacher tells you, mm, you know, it's not going to be marked. Uh, nobody's going to care about the result. Uh, most, most people wouldn't even bother to study, right? Um, but if someone is motivated, uh, um, the exam has some bearing towards your future, uh, there is a fair marking system available, um, then the motivation is there. Yeah? More effort uh, would come through. Uh, so performance will get better. But when it is too much, uh, like anyone who's been overly anxious before exams uh, probably can sense, uh, there is uh stage where nothing else goes in yeah so so that's when the stress level is too much and then you just can't function uh, as well anymore right so that, that's what the this curve means basically okay and uh, this is a kind of table from um, this researcher uh, stress researcher in 2009 um impact is mostly about it talks mostly about the HPA axis, yeah. So that's why I talked a bit about it earlier as well. Uh, so that's the hypothalamus uh, pituitary adrenal uh, axis, and the outcome in terms of uh, glucocorticoid uh, levels. And we can see that at different life stages, yeah, prenatal, even uh, as a growing uh, fetus, as a growing baby, um, there is already some impact uh, to the brain development. Yeah, um, so postnatal, um, from birth to like uh, around age seven, eight, adolescence. And uh, why this matters? Because uh, the brain continues to develop all the way until young adulthood. Yeah, yeah this is uh, 
around age mid twenties is about the time when uh, the frontal lobe, that's the front part of the brain, complete uh, maturing. Yeah, that's why in some countries, apparently, they only allow people to get a driving license after you are 25 and above. <laughs> because that, that's supposed to cut down on, uh, on, uh, on the accidents rate. Yeah, too young and um, you know, uh, not as mature yet. Right? So um, that's... Uh, and because uh, stress responses predominantly affect these different areas of the brain, yeah, so and they mature at different times, right? So like the hippocampus mature uh, in infancy, yeah, around age two like that. Uh, frontal cortex uh, until like that, until about uh, mid teens, and then the amygdala all the way here, right? Yeah, all right. And at different levels, uh, we might get different impacts uh, from this. Um, there is also a concept that um, sometimes the impact of stress, especially chronic stress may not be felt immediately yeah so it might actually just stay in the background um, until another time when there is another type of stress coming up and then the full-blown impact comes up right so that's uh, what might happen and of course um, for the elderly um, in aging especially uh, the concern is about cognitive decline uh, when when uh, the stress level is unmanageable um, for the elderly uh, the people can um, experience cognitive decline right Okay, so um, now, okay, so I'm going to talk a bit more here about PTSD, right? So the original talk uh, is about stress-related disorders. Uh, so PTSD one is one of the hallmarks of it. Um, the concept about post-traumatic stress uh, has been around for as long as there's been wars. Yeah, so back then, even in the Greco-Roman wars in uh, whatever century, uh, there is already a concept that some people can um, have long-term changes uh, in personality or in behavior after uh, this, the horrors of war, basically. And then, of course, after World War One, World War Two, people start describing it as uh, shell shock. Or at some point, people actually thought it was really a biological condition caused by nerve damage uh, from the gas, right? Uh, but later on, uh, after Vietnam War, especially. Uh, people are starting to realize that this is uh, more of a psychological condition. Yeah? And in the extreme, it can be very, very severe to the extent that uh, um, the person can be very much affected in, in all parts of their lives. Okay, but um, that being said, uh, in order to make it to a formal diagnosis uh, in a book like DSM-5, you know, that, that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Yeah, that, that's the book that uh, a lot of psychiatrists around the world use to diagnose psychiatric conditions. So in order to make it there and to have an official diagnosis, so to speak, uh, there needs to be a kind of line drawn. Yeah? So uh, we have to decide like, okay, at this point, then it meets the criteria. Uh, below this point, it doesn't meet the criteria. Okay? So one of the first things uh, people try to set boundaries of or try to put a box on is the definition of the stress itself that qualifies for PTSD, right? So remember earlier I mentioned that um, in its broadest terms, uh, stress is anything that exceeds uh, the capacity to cope, right? Uh, but for PTSD, we need something beyond that. So uh, they actually put it as uh, uh, the experts that actually come down with this uh, diagnostic criteria actually put it as an exposure. That means the person has been exposed, has experienced um, actual or threatened death. Okay, cannot be actual death lah if it is a personal experience, right? Because um, wouldn't be there otherwise afterwards. So uh, exposure to actual or threatened death, uh, serious injury, or uh, sexual violence, right? And um, for the SM five, this can be a direct exposure. Um, or witnessing in person, or actually learning that a close relation was exposed to the trauma. Yeah? So, so the diagnosis is quite broad. Uh, after that. In fact, uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. And Or in the case of professionals, so if you are a police officer or you are an ambulance crew, um, if someone is exposed to this on a daily basis in, uh, in the course of their work, or maybe someone work in the court you know, and, uh, or in the crime investigation arena, or as a psychologist or psychiatrist even. Yeah? And um, if you happen to hear a lot of details of uh, someone else's trauma, 
uh, that qualifies into this PTSD diagnosis and you get severely affected, uh, then you would qualify as having PTSD as well. Yeah. Um, it doesn't apply, however, to people who get the symptoms from watching movies or, you know, sometimes, uh, a lot of times these days people watch on social media. Um, there is a prevalence of this kind of recordings of accidents and all that on social media. Yeah, if your finger itchy and then you click it eh, and then you watch it and then after that you cannot sleep, got nightmares and all that. Uh, sorry, like, that one doesn't qualify. Like, right? <laughs> so. Okay, so um, after that, there is a lot, a whole lot of series of symptoms um, in different categories. Okay, uh, so I'm not going into details about how many you need to have from each category, but just know that uh, there are different categories and uh, the person needs to have uh, some symptoms from each category, right? So um, I'll talk a bit more about the intrusion symptoms um, because this is something that can be quite disturbing. Oh, actually, all the all the all the categories can be quite disturbing, right? But uh, let's start with intrusion. Okay, I need to check the time. Just one more. Hmm. Okay, just one. okay, still got time. All right. So intrusion symptoms. Um, it's something that the person cannot control. Yeah. So so uh, attempts to control it usually backfires. Um, I think a very mild or uh, general example is if I tell you don't think of a black and white penguin, okay, or don't think of a pink elephant, cannot think of pink elephant, right? And if you notice, you pay close attention to what's happening in your mind, and you're not doing something else, some other tricks like focusing on something else, right? Um, you may notice that although you are trying very hard not to, to think of a black and white penguin or pink elephant, um, it might come up to your mind anyway. Okay, so so that's the nature of thoughts. Um, oftentimes we can't control it, right? So, um, and it is especially worse when it is uh, a traumatic event. Yeah. So uh, the memories, the thoughts um, related to the traumatic events, tend to come up again and again and again, um, and the person may not be able to control that. Okay. Uh, it can come up in dreams as nightmares or bad dreams in general. Uh, can come up in flashbacks. Uh, that's when the memories uh, become so strong, the person um, almost dissociates or even completely dissociates from the, their present moment and in fact get absorbed into the memory. In the worst scenario, it is almost as if they are hallucinating the whole thing again. So the, the whole thing happens again and they are re-experiencing it as if they are there again. Yeah? So that's in the worst case scenario. Uh, most cases, flashbacks are not that dramatic or not that uh, not that intense. Um, it's probably more a bit like a video playing in your mind. Yeah, sometimes with a bit of sensation coming up, so that that can happen. Um, how, why I can say that because I had that after I broke my leg uh, in a pretty bad fall, um, pretty bad uh, cycling accident actually. So that flashbacks actually happen um, again and again for almost a year. Yeah. Uh, and there was some fear of uh, walking downstairs and all these things. Uh, I didn't develop the full symptoms of PTSD uh, because I didn't avoid uh, the things that uh, remind me of these things, right? So um, you, anyone who's experienced uh, any of the traumatic event uh, may experience any of these things. Not always, yeah, so, so not always. And uh, physiological reactivity would be things like faster heartbeat, sense of tension, um, blood pressure, that kind of thing. Now, this is the avoidance part. Uh, in a sense, the avoidance actually contributes to the, to the disorder. Yeah, it, it makes the disorder more long lasting. All right? But uh, there are caveats. Right? Um, in another sense, the avoidance is probably helpful as well to help the person cope with life. Okay, so it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, in other words, I hope, uh, and this is very important and I'm taking the time to just say this, huh? um, not just because you watch or listen to this presentation, uh, you start thinking, in case you happen to know someone who's got PTSD or PTSD symptoms, uh, then you start thinking like, oh, you know, just, just expose the person to the circumstances. Yeah? Uh, that doesn't always work. In a lot of cases, it backfires as well. Okay. Um, there have been a lot, uh, no, not, not just one, a lot, actually, uh, of uh, situations where someone with PTSD, um, probably, let's say, from a road traffic accident. Yeah? And we know that uh, these days when these things happen, a lot of it is captured on camera because uh, you've got this uh, onboard uh, vehicle. 
um, recording, right? So often they actually want either themselves or the family actually do have uh, a recording of the, the accident, okay? And usually someone else in the family would encourage them or even force them, um, force the patient to watch the, the video, all right? In the, in the, with the a, with a mindset that is going to be helpful, okay? So um, try not to do that because uh, if the person is not ready, it's actually very cruel to do so, all right? Okay, so um, negative alterations. Now this one is a whole broad category of uh, many different symptoms, but essentially, um, apart from the first one, a lot of it is to do with um, this. Yeah, a lot of negative beliefs about uh, the self, about other people, about the world. So for example, a person may uh, believe that uh, I'm a bad person yeah, may, because of some accident or some trauma that they have experienced, a lot of self-blame. Um, or a person may believe that the world is unsafe, is completely unsafe, right? Or a person may believe that uh, no one on earth can be trusted. Yeah, I, can, I cannot tr um, trust anyone ever again, right? So, so um, there can be this kind of uh, negative beliefs that's very persistent. Uh, this can be carried for years and years and years. And sometimes the person may not even be aware of it that they carry these uh, negative beliefs. Um, lack of interest, all right. Sometimes there can be a sense of numbness, yeah, a feeling like uh, the relationship with others is just not the same anymore or just can't feel any positive feelings anymore. And um, this, uh, in some cases, not very common, but in some cases, a person may actually completely forget of certain details of the accident. But this is not because of uh, head injury, not because of uh, alcohol or other substances. Yeah? It's uh, because of the trauma itself. Okay, so uh, alterations in arousal reactivity. So a person may become quite irritable, can change uh, on the outside uh, a person Someone else might observe that the, the person may become, uh, may get angry more easily, maybe may more short tempered, maybe more anxious, more jumpy, more depressed, right? So a lot of these things. Um, and sometimes there is sleep disturbance. Again, not always. Yeah. So, um, so the symptoms need to last for more than one month. Okay. Um, if it is less than a month, actually, we call it something else, yeah, acute stress reaction. So that, that's a different diagnosis. But um, the examples, uh, the symptom examples are quite similar to PTSD. Okay, so risk factors. Now, this one is uh, quite contro not, not, not controversial actually. Uh, these are widely accepted. Yeah? So, uh, but the half of the audience may feel like um, being put on the, on the stand. You know? <laughs> but it is just one of the facts of biology, uh, maybe facts of life, just that females are more uh, vulnerable, right, uh, to PTSD, anxiety, depression. Yeah, it's, it's just like that, right? So, um, and interestingly, uh, although females um, uh, have a higher risk factor of developing PTSD after a trauma, uh, the incidence of trauma among females itself is actually lower than males, you yeah? know, because males have, uh, especially young ones, eh, um, have a higher risk taking behavior again in general we are talking about in general you know on a population wide basis or thinking of everyone on earth you know uh, that kind of thing so on a very wide term of course you may be the exception uh, and all that but uh, you know uh, we, if you are talking about population wide basis this is uh, what it looks like right uh, neurotic personality so that that uh, means someone who tends to be a bit more anxious thinking a lot that kind of thing yeah uh, an actual history of depression or, or anxiety all these things tends to predispose uh, to developing PTSD, right? Okay, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about the events. Okay, just checking the time. The kind of events that would qualify as trauma itself. Um, earlier, I mentioned that um, it kind of changed yeah, over time. So you can see that um, in the 1980s, uh, using the SM3, um, they put it across as recognizable stressor that would evoke significant symptoms of distress in almost anyone, all right? So putting a very high bar there, right? Just set the bar very high in almost anyone. So we are talking about really about wars, getting captured in war, becoming a prisoner of war, you know, that kind of thing, right? Or severe, severe accident. Uh, so that's the SM3. So over time, the understanding of uh, PTSD and trauma-related um, uh, diagnosis 
um, have changed with more research and all that, uh, probably from, excuse me, from around the 1990s onwards. Uh, yeah? So it's uh, still a fairly new uh, sub uh, area of uh, psychiatry in that sense. So in um, 1987, yeah, that's the SM3R, so the adjusted version, the revised version. Uh, now it's put across as out, an event that is outside the range of usual human experience. Yeah? Again, that concept of markedly distressing to almost anyone, you know, so still a very high bar there. All right, so in the SM4, uh, so about 13 years later, right, the diagnosis changed. So it's like moving the goalposts, right? Um, so the goalposts, uh, the, the goal, the goal become a lot larger. So it's a lot easier to hit or kick a ball into it, right? Now it becomes something like uh, that was uh, pretty similar to the current uh, diagnosis. Yeah, so involve actual or threatened death or serious injury or a threat or a threat to the physical integrity of uh, self or others. Yeah, but witness and experience and confronted. Yeah, and um, that's something that evokes this intense fear, helplessness, or horror. So they go more into this um, emotional reaction of, of this fear, helplessness, and horror. Uh, as a result, the, there are actually increased diagnosis, right? So uh, there was a study from around back then that compared um, what's roughly the number of uh, persons that would qualify as having this trauma diagnosis. Uh, we are not talking about PTSD, but just uh, qualify for this level of trauma, right, within the population. And they found that using the DSM-3R, versus uh, DSM-4 results in a 20% increase. Yeah, So under DSM-3R is about 60 something percent. DSM-4 will be 80 something percent. Now you may be surprised, wow, 80% quite high. Eh? Actually it is, it is very high. Yeah. So how common are these traumas? It's actually very common. Yeah? So, so um, this one is a population-wide studies. Uh, so nationwide kind of studies, US, Canada. Figure is about 90, uh, 80 to 90%. Yeah. So, um, I mean, for myself, I probably have two or three already, like, all, all from sports accident, right? So uh, it's actually pretty common if uh, one thinks about it. So um, also depends on how the traumas are defined, right? As we talked about earlier. Then the next question is, how many of these individuals actually develop PTSD? So actually not so many, yeah? So, so it's about 10% or less in, uh, in most studies. The actual number differs a lot. Yeah, so I, I've seen a range from about six, seven percent all the way to almost twenty percent, right? Depending on the type of trauma you are studying, and the type of population you are studying. Um, and how do people get better? Okay, we are uh, nearing the end of the presentation, so uh, you can see it's a bit uh, more sparse. Yeah? But uh, essentially, if uh, a person wants to get diagnosed, um, you probably need to see a psychiatrist yeah, to get a diagnosis. Uh, Therapy-wise, uh, it is still a big question mark, uh, what is better, as in therapy or medication or both, right? So um, uh, there is still no clear uh, result uh, when people do this kind of studies to compare the, the treatment, um, whether it is uh, therapy or medication or both. Yeah? So in the end, it depends on what's available. It depends on what uh, the person's preference is, yeah, and what, what the clinician preference is as well. And of course, that's that will be discussed, lah, right? Uh, Medication-wise, uh, only two, yeah, only two types are actually uh, considered appropriate. Uh, one is an SSRI, uh, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Uh, that's uh, one of your antidepressants. Both are antidepressants actually. Uh, which, if you have attended any of my talks um, on anxiety, you probably know that. It's the same medication that's used for anxiety as well. Yeah? So whether it is anxiety or depression or PTSD, uh, the medicines are quite similar. It's actually the same kind of medications. Uh, Therapy-wise, there are specific therapies that can be helpful for, for PTSD. Uh, so that one is uh, trauma-focused CBT. Uh, CBT, if you might have heard of, uh, is actually cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah? It's a it's a very standard therapy these days. So um, when people say they go for counseling, very likely the counselor, uh, if they have been trained in it, lah, yeah, if they have been trained in it, very likely they they will be using something called uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. It is a kind of therapy that um, 
essentially help uh, the person understand or help teach the person and not just teach but but also apply in daily life yeah uh, apply how they can examine this in daily life um, analyze it in daily life uh, that help a person see how uh, their thoughts and their emotions and their uh, actions can all be interlinked and how uh, it can improve or worsen the condition all right so it's very empowering in that sense uh, help the person understand that and um, hopefully they can shift in one direction uh, hopefully in, into improvement uh, you know? um, so for trauma focusivities uh, for trauma focusivity um, there are certain uh, tips or practices that that's more appropriate yeah so so for example things like a uh, uh, concept of graduated exposure um, so that's part of it and of course a lot of the education matters a lot as well to the person yeah, to understand that a lot of these symptoms are actually uh, something that happens naturally in some ways yeah and uh, to remove the self blame from it to understand how these thoughts um, self blame uh, or blaming other people blaming the world may not be very helpful okay, in in fact can actually worsen the condition as well yeah of course again like the what, what we did earlier with the black and white penguin you cannot just tell the person uh, just don't think about it all right that, that's the number one complaint that uh, a lot of patients have told me lah, all right so so uh often the family will tell them oh just don't think about it lah. okay <laughs> just just uh you know if, if you've done any of uh, reflection or probably some mindfulness practice you know that these things don't work yeah so so um when uh usually a family member who tries to be helpful try to tell someone else who is actually suffering from this condition to just don't think about it or just snap out of it uh, usually it's not very helpful right so so uh, and i know often people uh, come to this kind of talks uh, because they want to understand more uh, so often not for themselves but for, for someone else in their lives yeah so so I, I do appreciate that sentiment i do appreciate that you may be trying very hard to help someone else in your life all right but just realize that certain things you see may not be very helpful in that sense all right so um, therapy, that's uh, trauma focusivity and uh, EMDR. Yeah, uh, EMDR is less commonly talked about, mm -hmm. but a bit more popular these days. Uh, doesn't involve so much talking. Um, it's uh, eye movement. It stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Yeah. So um, in practice, uh, if we use the eye movement, um, you know, I'll be use moving the finger like that, and uh, the person will be following. It's, it's not hypnosis, okay? But but uh, when you are doing that. Uh, okay, don't, don't try this at home, eh? but uh, when a patient does that under the supervision of the therapist, um, it seems to help with uh, reprocessing um, of the traumatic event. Yeah, so eventually uh, it allows recovery, right? Okay, so um, after that, still have a bit, a few more minutes. I'll just talk about another common, um, another common, in fact, this one is a lot more common than PTSD. Uh, this is called adjustment disorder. Yeah. So uh, it is considered a stress-related disorder. To qualify for it, the person needs to have something that's stressful that's been happening in their lives, right? Now, the great thing about this disorder is that it doesn't specify what kind of stress. Uh, so the patient or the doctor do not need uh, the very high bar of traumatic stress that applies in PTSD. So it's very much um, any kind of stress, yeah? Um, that includes going to a new school, starting a new degree, or uh, failing an exam, uh, getting married, so um, uh, quitting a job, changing jobs, pretty much anything can qualify. So, um, which then leads to a development of emotional or behavioral symptoms. Again, very broad, very broad category, can be anything yeah? um, that occurs within three months of the onset of the stressor. So, yeah, yeah, so so it's a pretty uh, a diagnosis that's quite open use. Lah, yeah? So um, it's quite easy to make this diagnosis in a sense. Um, quite common in uh, for people who, let's say, just join NS or, you know, just, just starting work, that kind of thing. So it's pretty common. Okay, so looks like that is the last slide. Uh, there are a few other... Um, trauma and stress related disorders like uh, I mentioned one just now which is uh, the acute stress reaction which is uh, something like PTSD but less than one month so that falls under acute stress reaction 
uh, they are also something that's more specific to uh, to children. Yeah, so like reactive attachment disorder. So those uh, are not exactly my area of specialty. Uh, so I don't talk much about that lah. But just know that such a thing exists. Uh, those are pretty rare. Uh, usually involve situations when uh, a child, very young child, usually we are talking about one, two, three years old, four years old, that kind of thing, um, who's been through a lot of very severe uh, traumas uh, or attachment issues, maybe very, very complex stuff um, that, that's uh, really affecting their lives. Yeah. Um, so that's about it.